Before we begin, I would like to set down three things. Firstly, this critique isn't meant to devalue your own experience of Bloodborne and isn't attacking you personally. While I feel like my critique is completely focused on objective facts, some of it will be filtered through my experience of playing the game and my general views on Souls likes. Secondly, despite the thumbnail, this isn't a direct response to H Bomber Guy's video. In fact, I haven't even watched it as of time of writing because I want to put down my own thoughts on the game without his views mingling in. I will have a section for his video at the end because I do have at least one rebuttal to throw at him. The thumbnail and the title are to appease the algorithm mainly. And lastly, why the hell am I actually making this video? Well, I have a stupid sense of hating injustice and while Bloodborne isn't a bad game, I feel like it's a mediocre game that gets overpraised while the best game in the series, the one which set the groundwork for good systems still used in Souls games and even Sekiro, gets dunked on for being bad. Yes, I am talking about Dark Souls 2, and I will die on the hill that it's still the best game in the series, Dark Souls 4 be damned. Now that I probably alienated everyone, let's get to chapter 1. Why do people like Bloodborne? Well, while I'd love to eat their squishy brains so I can analyze their thought patterns, I'd need to go outside for that and that's too scary. However, I can tell you what drew me to Bloodborne. And that was style. Bloodborne was by far the most stylish and sleek looking entry in Dark Souls, until Elden Ring's extensive wardrobe finally dethroned it. But uh, Lovecraft Mythos' visuals are eaten up faster than you can blink in this day and age, and it was even more so back in 2015 when the style was just stretching its wings into the mainstream video game scene. Combine it with Dark Souls' already opulent and gothic architecture and you get a masterclass in eye candy. And that's not even talking about the stylization of the moon, and the focus on making every armor look nice on your probably hilariously disgusting Harry Potter clone. <laughs> the whole style can be summarized as familiarly alien, which is probably the best way to describe Lovecraft's work, if the word insane has been used one too many times already. But. I'm afraid that's where this dreamlike nightmare ends, because this game's biggest flaw emerges. Style is all it has. Chapter 2. Mechanics. Or lack thereof. Now, this will take some explaining, so sit back as I steal this infographic from another Anderson and rewrite it to suit my needs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Souls likes are built around this chain here. You create your character and you enter the chain. First step is using your basic character to engage in combat, explore and fight cool bosses. Second step is accounting for loot you get during the first step. Armors, weapons, rings, upgrade components and of course souls. Uh, sorry, blood echoes. Because it has to have blood in it. Finally you allocate your souls, choose which equipment you wish to use, upgrade where needed and you finally loop back into combat. This loop can happen hundreds of times depending on how thorough slash bad you are, finally culminating in one final boss. Let me highlight where Bloodboat fails by colors. Oh. Oh no. Well, let's go one by one. Chapter 3. Okay, I'm gonna stop doing this now. Combat systems and how they fail. Let me just get the obvious out of the way, because even people who like Bloodborne probably knew this was coming. The healing system. Why? Just why? For the two people who don't know, when Souls likes, you have a few health potions which restore an amount of HP. You can increase how many you have and how much they heal, and they are instantly replenished when resting at a bonfire. Good system. Dark Souls 2 made them even better, creating a system, which is still used today, because it just works and it came out a year before Bloodborne. So... Bloodborne decided... I should close the window. So Bloodborne did a line of coke, said, fuck all of that, I'm going to create a system so shit that not even Neo can top it. You can have up to 20 heals at all times, but the only way to get more is by farming enemies. 
this creates two massive problems. It makes the game absolutely awful for new players, because if you're bad at the game, the game just unnecessarily punishes you. And secondly, it punishes everyone for dying repeatedly in boss fights and in general. You know, the things Souls-likes are known for? It's literally in the fucking title of one of them? Now, Dark Souls 2 was punishing to new players for a few reasons, but I think one of them was the lack of Estus Flask at the start. You only get one or two if you explore well in your starting area. But these flasks are always there, and because of their scarcity, while you are learning the game, they can make themselves into resources you have to truly ration. There are also life gems in this game, and while to a veteran they are just free healing and can be abused for infinite HP, I'd argue first time players will not fully engage with them to get to that point. But it still provides them with great boons in the sprawling levels of Dark Souls 2. It helps that the game chucks them at you with reckless abandon, making you understand they aren't too precious to use. And even when you are maxed on Astus Flasks, because DS2's DLCs are so large, they are still a boon to have and to buy even in the late game. In Bloodborne you basically can't increase how much they heal and have to occasionally spend 30 minutes to an hour in a boring beginner's area, farming them even when you are at the end boss. Because some absolute moron decided that unlike life gems, these completely finite heals can't even be bought for a reasonable price in the late game. And if you are a complete newbie, you can choke on a railroad spike and try to learn the game with no chance at fucking up without dying. Although, as you might know, there's a secondary way to regain health. Violence. Each time you take a heat, you can attack an enemy to regain a portion of the HP you've lost. This system should be great. It means there's a secondary way of regaining HP, right? Seeing as I'm a man who hates wasting resources, this should be great for me. Right? Right? Well, the best way I've found to interact with this system is to not. Just take the heal when it lines up good for you and otherwise never rely on it. I am not joking. It isn't as much a fault of the system itself as the game you are playing and the <coughs> next issue, but it's seriously not worth going for heals on bosses or enemies apart from the very first Kerrig Beast boss fight. But that one of course gets trivialized by it. You can just spam R1, occasionally dodge while circling around him, Retreat when you can't regain any HP and are below half, and stop attacking once every century when you actually run out of your seemingly infinite stamina. But the best way to interact with the system being to never actively try to engage with it is not very, well, good, is it? <sighs> the dodging in this game is terrible. You basically step to the side a bit very fast. But as far as I can tell, it doesn't actually give you iframes, and because it doesn't make your hitbox any smaller, unlike dodge rolling, it fucks over my muscle memory because attacks I would have dodged if I had a roll, I get caught by because I have a shitty dash. It's also frustrating because, one, this system was designed to keep the player aggressive and on the enemy to take better advantage of the healing and make the combat faster. But it fails at it because dodge rolls are much more reliable and can be used in the same way but better, so why change it? And two, the dodge roll from Dark Souls 3 is still in the game. It just doesn't let you use it if you're locked on. Why? Just why? To annoy me specifically? Now after my run ended I managed to remember the hunter's bone exists, which lets you spam rolls and dashes better. I'm not sure if this lets you roll while locked on, but even if it did, getting it behind an item is absolutely stupid. Now, you might think from all of this that I struggled with Bloodborne. I'm just a salty bad player who can't play video game good. Well, I appreciate if you stuck around this long despite not listening to me, but I did have a rough time on my first playthrough actually. Because I, I picked a bad weapon and hadn't realized the biggest flaw with Bloodborne's combat, which is coming up next. So I rage quit. The first area. After restarting with a new character and choosing the best weapon in the game, as my starter, I steamrolled through the game only having issues with three bosses. Everyone else I basically killed first try. We will get to bosses in a bit. First, let's talk about the lever I needed to flip in my brain to understand this game's biggest flaw, and the true issue with combat outside of boss rooms. And that is that... <laughs> Don't 
do it. There's literally no point in fighting any single enemy in the game, basically ever. Not counting farming. A few enemies drop something unique when they die, but even that doesn't matter and we'll get to why in the loot section. And this is why I struggled on my first try, because as well as picking the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad hacksaw, I wanted to treat this like any of the three Souls games and beat my feet through areas by slaying every enemy I could. There are... So... Fucking many enemies. Dark Souls 2 gets dunked on for having this many enemies, but a lot of the times it throws them at you one or two at a time. Meanwhile, this game can have three people bearing down on you while two shoot from a distance, and I've never heard anyone else call it out for it. But the enemies are actually terribly placed, because unlike in Dark Souls 2, they are not put in your way. They are just hanging out, and they are not at all built to catch you. So in the first combat area of the game, the best lesson you can learn is that you shouldn't play the fucking game. This is one of the main reasons Elden Ring didn't become my favorite Souls-like as well. The only way I can have fun there is acting like the enemies are blocking my path. Because otherwise, what's the point of fighting anyone ever? <sighs> to give a brief respite from all that negativity, let's look at some of the places you'll explore. Do you hear our prayers? They are excellently crafted to feel like a city that is under siege both by beast and its own men, who are themselves far more beast-like than they'd like to admit. All the NPCs you meet are callous, and a lot of them are scared of you and the hunt. The world, despite how small it actually is, this game is very short, does feel lively. And there's no better example for this than Old Yarnum. Despite all my dislike of this game, Old Yarnum is in the great book of best souls areas. From the loot being tied perfectly to the lore, to the crazed madman shooting a chain gun at you from the rooftop, to the actual layout being fluidly interconnected while still feeling like a place that could exist. After slogging through the opening and getting disappointedly not manhandled by Daddy Gascoin, this area is what kept my spirits up that maybe, maybe this game could turn it around and be great. And while it ultimately didn't, this area is definitely not to blame for that. Granted, I did run into an issue while exploring, which was especially terrible within the Nightmare Frontier. And while it wasn't the game's fault, I do want to mention it here and at BSP. You probably noticed the lack of Bloodborne footage from me, and that's because I'm recounting most of this from memory as I played Bloodborne with PS Now, and I no longer have a subscription. Now this only affected a few things. I couldn't play with a keyboard, which is my go-to in any game, and I stuck with controllers, so I was in a permanently nerfed state. And secondly, it did sometimes turn entire areas and even boss fights into complete eye rape as everything got pixelated. As I mentioned, the Nightmare Frontier was by far the worst offender because of the abysmally high polygon count. It also turned Bloodstarved Beast into the much more menacing Bloodstarved Pixels. Before we continue on to loot, let's also talk about the DLC and Chalice Dungeons. I didn't do either. The DLC because I didn't have access to it, and the chess dungeons because not even people who liked the game enjoy them, so I didn't think there was a point if I already wasn't having the best of times. I personally don't think there is a need to review the DLC. I am going to make the bold claim that my main issues with the combat don't go away, and that the bosses being so hard combined with the other issues make them just insufferable. But even if it was a flawless masterpiece, it wouldn't redeem the base game. Even if Old World Blues came out as a DLC for Hunt Down the Freeman, it wouldn't make Hunt Down any better. It would just make me more confused, if anything. Ah, Cos. Or some say Cos. So, as I said at the start, through your exploration and not combat, you gain loot. But what was my issue with it? Well, let's start with the simplest ones first. Runes. They are the rings in this game, and they are disappointing. The main difference between them and rings is that you have to retreat to your Friarling Shrine to equip them. Now, this should mean that they are far more powerful because you can't switch them out as easily. Right? Well, you know those rings that you put on before you get to the good rings, like the life ring which just gives you a little HP, or special rings which are specifically used for certain builds only. Well, imagine if these were the only rings in the game, and it was annoying to swap them out. Some are too specific and not worth going out of your way to equip, some aren't usable in your build, and the rest is filler that you put on because, well, the slots exist, so you might as well fill them. 
it is dreadful at all, which contrasts terribly with how awesome they actually look. The portable nuclear beanbag launcher. A large majority of these runes also only help you with parry criticals, which appear in the form of guns. I severely dislike this. It basically removes viable bow equivalents from the game, and you don't even have XZ access to simple spells, meaning you have basically no long range options except for consumables. It also means that guns deal zero damage if used on their own, without a specific build. But I'm playing through this game once, and I want to do it on my own damn build and not some other guys. I ain't even going into silver boots. It's a shit system. A terrible love child of Bloodborne's health potions and the spell charges of Old Souls game. Just don't even. I, and I say this despite having over a thousand in my stockpile by the end somehow. As for armor, they look great, as always. Mechanically, they are bankrupt though. And tell I'm intelligent because I use big words. The weight system has been removed and nothing took its place. Making all armor feel the same. You no longer need to increase endurance to become a Havel monster because there isn't a Havel monster you can be. And because there is so little difference between good armor and bad armor, you just choose whichever one you like the most and stick with it. The reason this is a bad thing is that it removes progression. You don't start out as a naked man running around, slowly putting on better and better clothing from random armor drops, which also aren't a thing in Bloodborne, and increasing your endurance to truly build your character. Another example of style over substance, I guess. And finally, weapons. And it only gets worse. Now, first let's talk about melee and how 99% of weapons don't need to exist. Fucking up by giving players some of the best weapons in the game early is a classic Dark Souls move. Dark Souls 1 had the Zweihander and the Uchikatana. Dark Souls 2 had all the bonking sticks and the very early Dragon's Tooth hidden somewhere. And Dark Souls 3 had Vort's Hammer, which is by far the worst contender so far, because it would be probably be drawn towards it and oh boy can it trivialize most non-DLC bosses with ease. Finally, Elder Ring has like 10. But my personal favorite is the Fang. And Bloodborne knocks it out of the park with literally one of the three starting weapons being the best, or second best, weapon in the game. Now the other games at least made you get a lot of stats to use your weapons, or they weighed a ton so you didn't only need strength but also endurance. Well, endurance was a myth made by big fire people to sell more levels, and the X has no stat requirements, so that's out the window. And here's where it all culminates into a shit show with all the other issues this game has. Because the terrible dodging, stressing about never using heals so I wouldn't have to farm, lack of anything to truly min-max, and running past any encounter I wanted to, maybe not do my favorite things in Souls games. Where you beat an enemy, pick up the item he is guarding, and go... Oh, dude! That's gonna be so good when I replay this with a strength build! But I just didn't care here. And the same is true for magic. Oh, I like your funny words, magic man! Oh, I picked up a tiny tauntress. Isn't you just the cutest? Granted, I thought this was legit a melee weapon when I picked it up. Because why the hell would a small version be so powerful? And that's a big issue with magical catalysts in this game. Other than taking up an inventory slot, each of them, it is hard to tell when you pick one up because they don't have any consistency in their naming or style. Also, what the fuck is an ogre anyway? The other big reason I didn't want to engage with magic is that there is no way to respect at all in this game. I know Miyazaki loves their female character themed around rebirth holding a baby motive, but like, if three old ladies sufficed, I don't see why we can't give the doll a pair of scissors of unbinding and have them respect us in exchange for hairs of Ebritas or something else esoteric like that. And this also leads into the actual leveling in Bloodborne, which is about as shallow as can be expected at this point. The soft cap is at 25 for most skills. Bloodborne is a short game, but I feel like with how expensive the levels get and how low soft caps are, it doesn't leave a lot of room for experimentation or mid-maxing. Up damage, up HP, very occasionally put some points into the useless endurance, and repeat. Because your first weapon is so busted, there's no reason trying to level up a stat quickly to be able to use a different weapon, so unless you like parrying or the limited and unfriendly magic system, 
there's no depth to be found in leveling, and the lack of respecting means you can't experiment without starting a new playthrough. Chapter 999 The weak, the weak, and the somewhat strong. I'm a Souls veteran and have over 1,500 hours in Souls games without counting Neo and Bloodborne. Margit still beat my ass so hard I had to go get better loot on my first playthrough and came back overpowered. But that's an Eldering issue. Here I beat over half the bosses in one try and it didn't feel like it was because I was good but because of how weak or straight up pathetic they were. Let's talk about some of the noteworthy challengers and uh, the disappointments. I was really ready for Gascoigne to beat my ass, but despite getting stuck on multiple pieces of geometry throughout his beast phase, he still fell like a child getting eaten by a pig. Bloodstarved Pixels is noteworthy because he has a very large design flaw. Other than having so many particle effects that I couldn't see anything, I mean. Even if PS Now didn't time travel my rig back to the 1800s, he has a terrible poison system. Now, throughout Old Yarnum, you get plenty of poison tablets because and this boy poisons you, so you naturally try to use the pellets to remove it. Unfortunately, he doesn't poison you just by attacking. There is a cloud around him which repeatedly builds poison on you, so it isn't an extra punishment for being bad, it's just a fuck you from the developers to anyone ever. This also means that despite getting a ton of poison removals because of how quickly he can reapply it to you even without you taking damage, it's pointless to use them. And this isn't even taking into account how terribly slowly you use the item or how terribly fast he is. It's just not a good fight all around. I got through by spam, spam and more spam while hoping I'm dodging the strikes I can't see. Margo's vet nurse is the second to last boss if you don't count the secret boss. Wait, let me fix that sentence. Do 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 Both the weakness presence and the wet nurse are absolutely pathetic. Margo you can just run behind over and over again and even her most scary nightmare flurry can be dodged by accidentally dodging at the right time, which I did. And because I killed her first try, I've literally never seen what the attack even looks like. Not to mention that Butthole Face Presence had the best chance against me, beaten and bruised from German, who was the mini sense of my run. I only had 8 heals left, and despite getting hit by the attack that reduces your HP to 1, I still killed it first try with it putting up as good a fight as my hopes and dreams against the cold, uncaring vacuum of space. German then was actually challenging. Some of his attacks felt like the hitboxes had fallen with a rough crowd and were following Dark Souls 2's footsteps. And here's where I realized how much I hated the dash over the dodge roll. In the end, he still fell to the long arm of my axe. Finally, to finish out the bosses, let's talk about the probable choir boy enthusiast, Marty Logarius. He was annoying, but my main issue was with two things. Mainly, the sword attack has zero way of telling you you need to stab the sword to get it to stop instead of waiting it out like every other similar AoE in the series, or in most games. And the fact this is the only boss I actually felt the want to parry. His attacks are fast enough for me to instinctively repost if I studied them a bit. But then the game put him on fucking ramps. So even if the bullet connects instead of entering the next dimension and assassinating a different Kennedy, the game might just decide it can't be arsed letting you get the critical off. Now you might have noticed her, the bed of chaos in the room. She has been getting bigger and bigger as I stretch the PNG. Well, as we're done with the bosses now, let's talk about one of the worst designed things in all of FromSoft history. Mikalash, host of memes. While his memes and design is immaculate, he's by far the worst thing in the game. For one, nobody in their right mind likes enemies who run away. We tolerate when treasure goblins do it, but a boss who basically does nothing but run away or instantly vaporize you is fucking terrible. Not to mention he's so jank I can smell his code from here. If you stay still, he will stop running and wait for you to go after him. So you can just shoot him with anything. At your leisure, as long as you watch out for the dolls which do hit you for some reason. After a bit of damage he will keep running, into a room, where he will stand still until you enter. Apply same cheese. After that, he runs to a different place, which takes him about 2 minutes, 
and drop down and wait for you. There aren't even dolls here. Motherfucker even gives you the high ground this time. Who playtested this? Who? Which part of the production team gave a thumbs up for this worthless pile of code? <sighs> this game is just kind of a mess and at the end, despite the antediluvian magical artifacts, despite the magnificent armor sets and despite the crude and brutal weapons in the game, I just didn't want to ever replay it. Because there was an objectively best build to do and anything else was subpar. And even if I went with a subpar build on purpose, like I have done many times in many other games, what is the point of it all if all I do is run past enemies like I did in this run? This is one of the main reasons Dark Souls 2 is my favorite, because despite being able to run past anyone if you force it, the game will try to resist it and hurt you for it, forcing you to actually engage its combat and gameplay or suffer for playing so recklessly. However, this concept isn't perfect either. Iron Keep is a testament to that. But I feel like forcing the player to actually play the game will always be better than opening the world so much that the game itself gets lost in it, unless you deliberately close off the area and return to the old ways. I didn't mean for this to turn into an Elden Ring critique at the end, but then again I didn't think I'd ever actually make this video. Well, that about covers the flaws and my own grievances with Bloodborne. I'm sorry if I might have sounded a bit angry or frustrated here and there, I've just been wanting to get this off my chest for a while now. But before my conclusion, I think it's time we looked at the points I wanted to rebuke from Mage Bomber Guy's video, so I, I guess I'll have to watch that now, too, huh? So. After writing two drafts and then trashing both of them, I decided not to review Age Bomber's video. The main reason for it is because it isn't a review or a critique that I could, well, critique, but a single-minded, although very scatterbrained, rant. And critiquing that from the standpoint of a fully scripted critique would be stupid even though my initial draft had quite a nice ending, which is now going to waste. But so you don't think I chickened out on it, I will quickly list what my issues were. The video only viewed things through the lens of a beginner and didn't really consider mechanics from the standpoint of a veteran player. It was entirely subjective and subjectively considered shields to be always bad and didn't make an effort to show why shields can be useful. It also just completely ignored magic for some reason. Some points were cherry-picked, most notably the insinuation that Dark Souls 2's infusion system is at all complicating, and what lesson Dark Souls 1 tries to teach the player when giving them the shield, which is use it versus arrows, you daft cunt, and not use it versus everything, you daft cunt. Hypocrisy considering blood vials. As Age Bomber Guy very clearly criticized Demon Souls' herbs without putting emphasis that 90% of the issues can be set for blood vials in Bloodborne as well. And finally, Bloodborne will never be the entry point for most players because of its console exclusivity. Therefore, seeing it's great for beginners is completely hollow. And it only gets worse with time because why would you start Souls likes with Bloodborne in a day and age where Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring exists? or in the future when Eldest Ring 6 Tokyo Drift or Bloodborne 3 Silence of the Blood comes out. Saying Bloodborne is great because it's good for beginners only had any merit while it was the newest entry. And now that it only left it as a shallow, short game with great exploration and art direction, if you care about those things. But I don't. Ah shit, I get to use my old ending anyway. Get wrecked. Me. So, can we therefore conclude that I'm the rightest man alive and that Bloodborne is garbage? Well, no. You see, my bias will always be towards the technical RPG side of Souls-likes, much more than towards exploration and style. While I like my games to not actively try to rape my eyes, I don't care how good a game looks beyond the good enough to play, and I don't much enjoy exploring. Therefore, because Bloodborne is so heavily invested in those areas, I would never rate it as highly as people who that matters to. So, is Bloodborne garbage? No. But is it genius? 
well also now. The technical flaws I listed still exist, as well as a few I didn't mention for flow or time, and I don't think excelling in one area should make us totally forgive and forget its failures elsewhere. So if I had to rate the game personally, I'd give it a 5 out of 10. But if I had to compromise my biases, I would give it a 7 out of 10. Now, this video slash rant has gone on long enough, so I'll await my crucifixion by Bloodborne fans at Calverly to become Dark Souls 2 Jesus. Until then, I don't know, subscribe for more essays in the future. Peace. You think I could do that Spongebob French voice? One, no. One month and two hours and a month of procrastination later. That was awful. That was awful. <laughs>